Anybody who's been familiar with Radio Free Erin over the years will know that we've taken on many causes here, whether it was the burnt-out churches down south when they were being burned down to the ground. We had Bernadette Devlin Mikowski come over and do a huge uh, event here, a fundraiser for that. When uh, political prisoners in Turkey were on hunger strike, we had some of them, uh, relations of them, come over, and we did a fundraiser down at Rockies and showed a film about that. Now, another cause that Radio Free Erin is behind and helping out with is uh, the Guatemala victims. And you say, what about the Guatemala victims? Well, people at BAI would remember uh, all the shows that are done on the Tuskegee experiment where African Americans were used. Uh, and given, well, they, I don't know if they were actually given sexually transmitted diseases, but they certainly weren't given the cure for that. And that went from 1932 to 1972. But when it was found out in the 40s, uh, the same people that performed these, uh, experiments went down to Guatemala and did that from 1946 to 1953. And with us on the line is Piper Hendricks, who just returned from Guatemala. Uh, Piper, maybe you can give us an overall view, and how was this found out about this experiment? Because this is only fairly recently that uh, the American people learned about this. It is. It's fairly recently that, that the entire world learned about it. It's something that was taking place, as you mentioned, um, down in Guatemala at the end of the, the 1940s and into at least the 50s. Um, but no one knew about it because nothing was published. Everything was kept under wraps for decades and decades. And then in you know, 2009, 2010, Professor Reverby up at Wellesley College was looking through some of the old Tuskegee files, looking at the Alabama experiments and realize that there's more more than she'd seen before, you know, that she was looking at records from Guatemala as well. And so this all came to light more publicly in the fall of 2010 when President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton and Secretary of Health and Human Services Sebelius all publicly apologized to the, the Guatemalan people, to the Guatemalan government, and to the world at large. So that's the first time that, that the, the, you know, the world really knew that this had taken place in Guatemala um, back at the same time that the Tuskegee experiments were taking place. Well, w- one thing right now uh, is that with the, the people involved with the Tuskegee experiment, there was a, some sort of remedy for them. Maybe explain what was the remedy for them and now what has happened and, and what is the American government doing about what went on in Guatemala? Well, it's interesting to look at these two cases. I mean, there's some similar similarities for sure, and then there's some big differences. And, and one, as you mentioned earlier, in Tuskegee, the, the U.S. Public Health Service was watching people who already had venereal diseases, specifically syphilis, and seeing how that took course in took it over their bodies without providing any treatment. But one of the differences here is that in Guatemala, the researchers went down went down there and were intentionally infecting people, people who were well before the experiment started, and intentionally, knowingly giving them venereal diseases such as syphilis and cancroid and gonorrhea, uh, and then they did not provide treatment to all of them. There's indications maybe some, but not all. In Tuskegee, the victims have eventually filed a class action lawsuit, which was then later settled with the government. The government provided compensation to them as well as medical services and then burial uh, benefits when the survivors passed away and then eventually expanded those benefits to their families as well. And so what we've seen here with the Guatemala case, before we actually brought the case in court, we reached out to the government and said, hey, this is something that we need to, to talk about. You know, Maybe we can reach an agreement before we bring a lawsuit, which might surprise some people. You might think that plaintiff's attorneys tend to run to court as quickly as we could, but we recognize here that this is a pretty unusual case and wanted to see if we could reach an agreement beforehand. But unfortunately, we did not receive any response from the government, so filed a lawsuit in March of last year as a class action and you know, on behalf of all the people who were impacted. And we're talking 5,000 people who were used, at least, in the experiment, and 1,000 who were intentionally infected with venereal diseases. So it's not a small group, given that the passage of time, unfortunately, many people have already passed away, but you know, there's still several people who are surviving, and then their, their spouses and their families and the communities as a whole were impacted as well. And so where we are with the lawsuit now is here we are a year later. We still have not received any sort of indication from the U.S. government that they want to provide a remedy to the individuals who were impacted by this. And so in January of this year, quite to the contrary, the U.S. government filed a motion to dismiss 
saying that the case should be tossed out of court because of something that a defense called sovereign immunity. And basically, you can't sue the government unless they give you permission to. And there's some exceptions to that, but the government's arguing that none of those apply here. And so in March, just last week, actually, a week ago yesterday, we filed our responses to those motions saying that, no, this case absolutely should go forward and that immunity is just really not appropriate in this case. I mean, that there's times that you would want to, to shield the government so that people who are, are acting on its behalf don't have to worry about lawsuits in the course of doing their duties. But obviously, you know, looking at, at this type of case, it's in no one's scope of employment to be intentionally infecting people with diseases without their consent. Piper, you just returned from Guatemala, and you're talking about the impact on the families. Now, you know, people just are really focusing in on the people that were infected. But describe uh, some of the people you met down there and, and the impact individually between the suicides and the relationships mm-hmm. between the men and women. Well, and, and that's something, yeah, I think that, that we have to, to take a moment and, and think about how how you would feel if you found out years and years later that some medical exper- or medical treatment you thought you were receiving was actually part of an experiment that you weren't told about. Um, you know, being intentionally infected and not knowing that. I mean, people didn't know where some of these diseases came from. They just knew that they had something that was in their body that was impacting their their sexual organs and was very shameful to them. And so people who I spoke with years and years later, I mean, this is this is devastating. And thinking back over the fact one one gentleman, for example, didn't want to have children with his wife because he was so afraid that he would pass it on to her, pass the disease on to his children, and so it was very cold to her. And eventually they, they did have children. And in some cases you see people who were impacting their spouses. In other cases, thankfully, they did not. But he was, was beside himself. I mean, thinking she passed away recently and thinking how different his life would have been if he could have been warmer towards her, if he could have explained, you know, or if he didn't even have to, you know, have anything to explain. But he was very hesitant to, to say, here's why I don't want to have children. I have this shameful disease. I don't know what, where it came from, why I have it, how I can get rid of it. And, you know, passing things on to children, on to, you know, throughout an entire community, it, it's really, it's devastating. And, and as you mentioned, I mean, there were people who were so shamed by this and, and so devastated that they took their own lives after leaving the, the military. And that it just, the, the whole, the, there's really nothing good that came of this at all. I mean, from the very beginning, that the populations who were targeted, it, we're talking orphans, we're talking mental health patients, prisoners, soldiers, I mean, people who were in these vulnerable positions where some authority could say, sure, you know, use this population on kind of giving consent in a way on their behalf, except for the people who were giving that consent weren't, you know, anyone in the medical community will tell you that's not the person. You have to get the individual's consent. You can't have someone else in charge of some sort of institution giving permission on their behalf. And it's not clear that they really knew what they were consenting to. Um, they didn't know what what the researchers from the United States Public Health Service were really doing. So it's it's really it's ugly all the way around. And yeah, then and, at and, the end and, of the day, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I'm Piper. And also, you were talking about just the the culture in Guatemala. I mean, their history and about how you don't really question the government. I mean, between the civil wars and military dictatorships and everything like that, mm-hmm. there there's this big fear. What what do they do? do? They stick their head up. They could disappear like union leaders and everything else that's been going on, uh, the tragic history of Guatemala. No, you're exactly right. And that's something that's, that's continuing. I mean, thankfully, it's more peaceful today, but there's still definitely remnants of that and, and, and a lot of violence still. Um, even after, you know, the wars and things have ended. So it's, it's really kind of a, a scary thing um, to think about sticking, you know, you don't want to stick your nose out if, you know, there's no, no sure way that you'll get a remedy. Um, so that's where, you know, we, we have been focusing our case here in the United States on the U.S. government, um, has not been working with the, the Guatemalan government. But um, there's, there's just a lot, of, a lot of really sticky issues here with this case. 
And I know one thing, a BAI audience is an activist audience, and they probably want to figure out how they can help. And I just know that there was a letter sent to uh, President Obama with a lot of groups that signed on to it. And I'm proud to say the Taxi Workers Alliance and the Vets for Peace signed on it. But uh, over 50 human rights groups have signed on to it. That's went to Obama. Uh, there's websites. And I know I, I'm working with some council people to get a resolution, the New York City Council, also with another letter to Obama. But what can the the audience here at WBAI do to help out? I'm really glad you asked because there is something that, that every single individual can do. And that there's three things, actually. And if you remember three three C's, there's change, click, and Congress. If you go to change.org, we've got a petition there. And, and as you know, I mean, there have been some fabulous pieces recently talking about what an impact these petitions can have. And so if you go change.org and look for fair compensation for Guatemalan victims of U.S. medical experimentation, add your voice there. It takes literally five, ten seconds to sign up for this petition, and, and every voice there counts. What we're asking for is the U.S. government to provide a fair remedy to Guam- Guatemalan citizens, just as they did eventually for U.S. citizens as well. Um, the next thing is on our, our Facebook page, the same name, Fair Compensation for Guatemalan Victims of U.S. Medical Experimentation. You can click like and see all of our updates. We're getting a lot of good coverage, and we're really thankful for the support we've gotten, especially the groups there in New York. You guys have been fantastic. And there you can find the text of a letter that you can send to Congress. And Congress.org just got up and going recently. That's our third C, Congress.org. And you can send letters to all of your representatives, um, using the text of the letter that we've got on the Facebook page or writing your own and just saying, you know, whatever is, is on your heart with this. I mean, knowing what happened to people and knowing that our government is responsible and has admitted to that and still has not taken steps are, are really, it's, it's really egregious. And I think something that, that's easy for people to think, I mean, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of issues that we're all facing. It's a tough economy and, and you know, it's an election year. There's a, a number of things going on. But these, the medical experimentation and the lack of consent is still very much a, a relevant issue. I mean, you've got experiments going on in places like Africa where it's not really clear that people are giving their full and knowing consent to what's being done to their bodies. And so it's something that how we respond to this case isn't just something that we're looking backwards into the late 1940s and early 50s. I mean, it's still something that's going on. How do we as a society want to, to respond to this? And, you know, we should have learned back with the Nuremberg trials. I mean, the entire world came forward then and said, we do not support non-consensual human medical experimentation. We will not tolerate this. And yet here we are half a century later, over half a century later, and not quite getting it right yet. So I feel like this is something that we need to stand up and really say, here's where we are as a society. Here's how we want to respond. And if you, you know, if you want to weigh in on this, you've got Three great options. I really encourage you to go to the change.org petition, um, add your voice to the Facebook page, and then write your Congress people because this is something where we've been told no uncertain terms. If we hear more from our constituents, you know, this is something we might be willing to you know, stick our necks out on and, and, and take action on, but without voices from the community and with people, without people saying we care about this, then it's easy for, for Congress members not to make it a priority either. All right, thank you, Piper, and uh, for updating our audience on um, what's going on in that tragic part of our history. Great. Thank you, John, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, happy St. Patrick's Day. And that was Piper Hendricks, who's the lawyer for the victims down in Guatemala. Uh, also, go to Hackshots NYC. That's my blog there. I have up uh, an article in El Diario where myself and Pasta Vazul were carrying a banner in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Sunnyside, Queens, and you can read it in Spanish and in English, and there's also been editorials in the Washington Post, so we want to keep our audience up to date on what's going on with that. All right.